Welcome to this session of the DoD Cloud Exchange. My guest today is Andrew Churchill, the Vice President of Public Sector at Click. Andrew, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Pleasure to be here. The Defense Department's IT modernization journey is complicated as it is long. There's plenty of progress and more opportunities probably take advantage of cloud services and all the capabilities that come with it. In 2024, DoD asked for more than $58 billion in technology and cyber funding for unclassified systems. Who knows what the classified number is? That's $13 billion more than what they asked for in 2023. So, a lot to do. They have a lot of money. They have a lot of resources. How can they take advantage of it? That's my first question to you, Andrew. Uh, DoD, can they, what do they need to do to deliver on their IT cloud modernization initiatives? Uh, uh, Jason, look, they've spent a lot of money. They're going to continue to spend a lot of money. It's you know the biggest enterprise on the planet Earth. Uh, you know, thus far, when I look at it, I feel like a lot of what they've achieved is they moved the systems and the data to the cloud, and you know that really was just about it. Now. I, you know, I'll tell you, I think that's a really important step, uh, overcoming that policy hurdle of just getting authorization to move systems and data outside of their on-premises uh, data centers and networks. Uh, that, that, that really is the start of, you know, of where they needed to go. But now we're off to the races. So you know, what are they going to do with that uh, additional investment? Uh, to me, I think one of the things that's really important is now creating an enterprise of enterprises. So now they've gone and they've made awards to Microsoft and Google and, and AWS, and they now need to make sure that those systems and, and, and data environments are interconnected and operate just as they did when it was all behind their firewall. Uh, further, I think you know, one of the big things that needs to happen is sort of a cultural shift. How are they going to bring all of those people that manage these together and begin to you know, break down some of those silos now that they're in the cloud to take advantage of, of what the cloud is designed to make possible. You mentioned this idea of enterprise of enterprise, and, and let's be clear here, you're not talking about a systems of systems approach. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, we heard about you know, net centricity years ago, and now it's data centricity. Really, I mean, in many ways you're saying is how can agents, how can the defense agencies, the, the military services, get the capabilities and the data they need when they need it in, in as quick as possible by, by that enterprise of enterprises approach. Is, is that a good way to kind of present it? Absolutely. Uh, and you know, the, the big difference ends up being, I now moved my financial systems here and I moved my supply chain systems here to another cloud provider. I ATO'd those based on a set of policies about how they were going to interface in different ways and now I need to be able to rationalize the policies and the access to those systems to be able to support what really will be sort of these combination of assets that pr bring these things forward. So, you know, being able to create the agility within the processes that they use to integrate data, uh, to be able to govern data, control data, understand what's there, is going to help them position to move forward. Uh, so that I'm a, a, a new le I'm a leader that's coming in and needs to be able to deliver a capability that assembles from multiple different parts, but without all of the policy obstacles that get in the way. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> just, just, just break down those silos, integrate. How do they do that? What, what role does something like software as a service play in, in this discussion? Well, I mean, you know, software as a service is, you know, and I'll, I'll take a step back and I'll talk about the way Click approached software as a service. We did not, for example, take our analytics applications and simply say, hey, we're going to run them in a cloud and we're going to charge you as a service. We'll manage everything for you. We reimagined the way that those services were going to be consumed and deployed and therefore how we architected those systems. Uh, so what we really see as, as the potential is the idea that, that you are not going to simply you know, deliver that same application that you had on premise. You are going to have a set of services from you know, ServiceNow and AWS and, and Salesforce.com, uh, and I'm going to build this set of capabilities that does benefits enrollment or does personnel readiness in the DoD. Uh, and I'm going to make analytics, for example, front and center to all of those, those applications. And obviously, you know, the biggest buzzword that we're talking about, whether it's cloud or anything else, is AI and machine learning. How am I going to make those things available, uh, trusted, and ready to be able to support what obviously is going to become the most important thing in terms of strategic advantage uh, going forward? And I want to get to the AI and ML discussion because yeah. you have to at this point. Yeah. But when you talk about all these different 
pieces and parts that will come together in that new capability. I think that's really the, that set of capabilities as you describe it, whether it's ServiceNow or Salesforce or whomever, and pulling that data with an underlying analytics engine, uh, you know, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, is that something that DoD is starting to go down that path? Are you starting to see those capabilities starting to get built? Absolutely. I mean, if you look across all of the mill depths, you will find that they are organizing their data largely around domain platforms. So, you know, if you look at the Navy, they're building out their domain data platforms. So they're trying to, one, reduce the number of points that they're aggregating data, but they're also trying to drive ownership so that they can create what in the technical speak is, you know, data product as a service type of things on top of them. I'm this, I have the supply chain domain, I have the finance domain. I'm trying to create data products that can be easily consumed into higher level products. You look at a program like Advana within CDAO, they've done the hard work of physically aggregating data. Now they're going through the process of, again, trying to make it more readily consumable by all the builders that are out there uh, that are going to be helping. I was recently at uh, the big Department of Navy conference out in San Diego where uh, Advana, you mentioned that, was yeah. was one of the big conversation pieces. Jupiter is their, their instantiation of Advana. So I know that there's a lot of excitement around it, data-driven dashboards. Uh, underneath that, of course, as you mentioned, AI and machine learning, artificial intelligence, there's a lot of excitement around that. What are some of those capabilities that DoD is starting to do with AI, machine learning, other emerging capabilities? Because really what I've heard and what I think you'd agree with me is that it's all about that strategic advantage that they're trying to achieve. Yep. And I mean, I think, you know, Dr. Martel, who, the CDAO, I think was one of the first people to very publicly point out the fact that their data was not in a state where they could really begin building AI and ML at scale. They needed to sit back and lay down a foundation. And I think that is incredibly you know, sharp advice. Uh, you can't build the skyscraper that you know, AI is supposed to be you know, on sand. You've got to build it on bedrock. And so as you're trying to establish data, you've got to make sure that it is you know, governed, that it's trustworthy, that it's timely, uh, and that it's readily available to the folks that are going to build it. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of that activity right now. Click is exceptionally well positioned to be able to help these customers provide that real-time trusted data. Uh, and it is going to be the thing that powers not just those lighthouse projects that we're seeing. I mean, we're seeing success with AI and ML, but now to be able to put that into every aspect, every domain of the DOD mission, uh, that foundation is going to be critical. When you think about building that trust, the governance, the timeliness, and, and a lot of activity, anything comes to mind, an example that would say, hey, here's, a, here's a, something you know, the clicks involved in or something you're seeing otherwise where that's starting to happen? Because I think folks say, okay, that's great to talk at, at the high level, yep. but where is it really happening? Yeah, I mean, by the way, I, the, one of the places that we've seen, and I think I've talk, probably talked about it on a, on a, in an interview with you in the past, is really around Navy, Navy financial management. Um, they really set out with a view to one, try to provide real-time data, like status of funds is that term that gets you know, thrown about. It was always that Shangri-La moment. But we got way past that. We can get, okay, how much money do I have? But in on into, from formulation to budget execution, how do I get better visibility into what's happening you know, right now? So they were driving massive volumes of data out of their SAP ERP into Advana and also into Navy data platform to be able to support these types of analyses. And you know, what they've been able to do from that platform of making it available was incredible. They were able to build predictive models and be able to feed things that were sitting there saying during the budget formulation processes, you're not going to execute that. You're, this is going to get, this is going to be a risk, high risk for deobligation. So let's make other choices. Let's make sure that that money is going to places where it really furthers the mission of the Navy. And really what you're talking about here is understanding, as you mentioned, high risk for deobligation. You lose that money, it goes away. Yep. You, but if you understand, okay, getting that done this year, maybe moving that money from point A to point B, because that's a, another mission priority and there's never enough money, yep. uh, that's a big difference. Um, in, in the last couple of minutes we have together, Andrew, let me ask you, I mean, we've talked a little bit of AI, a lot of cloud. Those are great. We, we love talking about those topics, but really in the end, what, what we're talking about is mission outcomes. How can DoD deliver on its mission faster? What are some things that you that they need to keep in mind over the next year or two as they continue to move down this journey of IT modernization? Yeah, I rethink everything, I think is the- <laughs> So easy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, but by the way, the, we've, yeah. with low code, no code types of capabilities, 
the, the level of effort that you've previously expected as you deliver new capabilities, it's, it's very different. So you can you know, maintain your existing status quo capability, but when you start talking about AI and analytics, it is more everywhere. That should be the goal. It, in, you're going to deliver, I like talk about that Navy financial management, Naval, Naval financial management data belongs everywhere in personnel decisions, yep. supply chain decisions, in normal you know, tactical execution. What is it going to cost me? Do Am I funded to the level I need to be to execute that? So talking about pervasively embedding decision support capability in business process, mission process workflows everywhere you go is really the direction. Now, when you start talking about AI and ML, now, b being able to guide people based on the current trend, here's what's going to continue, and making those simple for analysts to both create, train, and deploy so that you've got now this workforce of analysts, not data scientists, analysts that are being able to do those things. And you know, finally, Jason, the thing that I think is really coming up next, obviously, uh, if you have large language models on your bingo card in 23 and 24, you're going you know, you're going to be yelling bingo. But that, that merger between large language model, gen AI type of capability, particularly around like retreat, the uh, retrieval augmented generation where it's going out and getting facts, tying that to the bigger model, combined with analytics and availability of data, it's going to be a game changer. There's a lot more to talk about. Unfortunately, we're out of time for this session of the DoD Cloud Exchange. So let me thank my guest, Andrew Churchill, is the Vice President of Public Sector at Click. Always a pleasure to catch up, Andrew. Love being here. I'm Jason Miller, and you're watching Federal News Network. Now let me send you back to the studio for more from the DoD Cloud Exchange.